أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإن ربك لهو العزيز الرحيم وإذ نادى ربك موسى أن ائت القوم الظالمين قوم فرعون ألا يتقون قال رب إني أخاف أن يكذبون ويضيق صدري ولا ينطلق لساني فأرسل إلى هارون ولهم علي ذنب فأخاف أن يقتلون قال كلا فاذهبا بآياتنا إنا معكم مستمعون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ثم اما بعد once again everybody assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, ELM for accommodating me last minute every time I had no intention of speaking in this program but something in my head says you've come all this way I want to see some wonderful faces and earn some duas so I asked them if I can take advantage and, and speak tonight. I'm actually here to attend a program and study myself. Uh, and that's going to start tomorrow. But I just landed today earlier on. So if I sound incoherent, it's the jet lag. Don't blame me. Um, <laughs> I think I'm doing okay though. Alhamdulillah. I have a, I've developed some good habits while traveling. I fall asleep before takeoff and usually wake up after landing. So, <laughs> so that's helped travel quite a bit. Um, I was also thinking about what reflection from the Qur'an to share with you this evening. It's a challenging task uh, to pick some place from the Qur'an that I think is relevant and beneficial. It's, this is a place in the Qur'an that's very near and dear to my heart. It's something that I used to teach all the time. It's one of the most remarkable, uh, beautiful passages in the Qur'an in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells a story. Uh, and it's the story of one of those prophets that if you're a student of the Qur'an, you have no choice but to have him extra dear to your heart. It's the, one, of the, one of the chapters of the story of Musa alayhi salam. And it's, it occurs in the context of Surah Al-Shu'ara. Surah Al-Shu'ara is the 26th surah of the Qur'an. It's a Makki surah. And in this surah, Allah Azza wa Jal from the beginning highlights the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is very stressed. Because there's a lot of propaganda against him. There's a lot of claims being made against him. There's a lot of accusations being made against him and against his message. And he feels like his message is not reaching anybody because every time he speaks the truth, there are a hundred mouths that speak lies about, about Islam. And when you have so many people making lies about Islam, you start getting frustrated that maybe the true message of Islam is never going to reach people. And it's, it's nearly killing him. The stress is nearly killing him. So Allah says, لَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ أَلَّا يَكُونُ مُؤْمِنِينَ are you going to kill yourself with grief? The stress itself, the depression will kill you if they, if they don't become believers. And in that opening consolation to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from there Allah took him directly to the story of Musa Alaihi Wasallam. To let him know that this frustration that you have, this challenge that you have in front of you, to present the true picture of Islam, even though there's so much animosity, and there's so much media against you, you can say, and there's even so much politics against you, in the face of all of that, you'll still be able to speak out for the truth if you know what you're doing. Here's your role model for this mission, for this part of your mission, and that would be in this case, Musa alayhi salam. So his story is given as an example to our Prophet والسلام, to overcome his challenge. Now why did I choose this passage? I chose this passage because we are now finding ourselves in a very similar challenge. We find ourselves not being able to articulate to the world the true message of Islam because there are so many voices, you know, confused voices within Islam and very angry voices outside of Islam that are speaking on behalf of our deen. And we get frustrated when people, will people even ever hear the true message of Islam? Are they ever even going to get the message or not? And we, we start feeling frustrated that this message is suffocating and it's being choked to death. And in the middle of that climate, if this Surah and this story was enough to inspire our messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam then it is more than enough for anyone after him because nobody had a heavier burden than the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so if it's enough for his inspiration it's more than enough for your inspiration and mine the ayah i began with is Allah reminding his messenger wa inna rabbaka lahu al azizur rahim that your master certainly he is the ultimate authority and always loving and merciful these are two opposite attributes of Allah almost 
On the one hand, Allah exercises His authority, and on the other hand, He's merciful. Now, don't think about Allah for a second. Think about authority and mercy. Authority and mercy. They don't normally go hand in hand. The police is an authority, a judge is an authority, you know. The military is an authority, the government is an authority. And you don't think of these elements with mercy. A mother is mercy, you know. A, f a family is mercy, a caretaker is mercy, somebody who's you know, doing, going out of their way, sacrificing their own comfort for someone else, that's mercy. That's love and mercy. These are two almost independent entities. And it's actually very shocking when a judge is merciful, or when a police officer is merciful. You know, or when a government is merciful and forgives somebody, that's actually pretty shocking because they're not associated with that. But Allah Azza wa Jal combines those two attributes of His own, describing Himself first, that Allah is the ultimate authority and He's always loving, caring, and merciful. Which says a few things. First of all, Allah has the authority to punish these disbelievers for the lies they make about Islam. Because when they make lies about Islam, they're committing a crime against Allah Himself. Allah has the authority and the power to punish them when He wants. But it's actually a mercy from Allah that He doesn't punish them. It's a mercy from Allah that He actually sent you, meaning the Messenger وسلم, instead to deliver a message to them with kindness. You know, we come from, many of us come from, you know, Southeast Asia, the, you know, Indo-Pak, Bangladesh, etc. We know that there are two kinds of education. One you do with your mouth, the other you do with your hand. <laughs> you could teach both ways. You know, kid goes, I don't get it. The teacher says, okay, come here, I'll, I'll help you understand. <laughs> and gives him a good one. He goes, you get it? I understand now. Very good lesson. Thank you, sir. Never forget this one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> to think about that. Allah can teach. He could teach by words. But he could teach other ways too. You know, inna batsha rabbika la shadeed. Allah, in fact, his grab is pretty intense. He could grab you and teach you too. But he decides to not exercise that authority and to teach with his loving, caring mercy. Now he's going to show how, how much, how merciful Allah is and how actually not only are you and I weak when we present the message of Islam, Allah actually gives us power and authority if we present the message of Islam honestly. And that's what Musa alayhi salam is going to do. This part of the story of Musa alayhi salam begins as, and I'll, I'll let the story tell itself. I'll let the ayat themselves tell you the flow of how, how the events pass and what Allah wants to highlight. He says, وَإِذْ نَادَ رَبُّكَ مُوسَىٰ أَنِئْتِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ When your master called on to Musa, when your master meaning Allah called on to Musa. Now we know that happened on the mountain. And on the mountain between Musa and Allah, there's a long conversation. It's not a short conversation, it's a very long conversation. And the full length of that conversation, you can find it in Surah Taha, in Surah number 20. From the very beginning, Allah introduced Himself. Musa salam was shocked. How do you even know my name? He told them to take his shoes off. There's lots of things that happened. And he said, what's in your hand? What's that in your hand, Musa? There are lots of things that happened in that conversation. But in this surah, Allah didn't highlight any of that. He didn't tell us about how the conversation began. Because that's not the point of the surah. Here Allah is going to highlight the mission of Musa salam And how he was supposed to carry that mission, a very difficult mission. So what does we say? When, Allah, when your master called on to Musa, anitil qawm al-zalimeen. That you need to go to the criminal nation. You need to go to the wrongdoing nation. Now there are lots of wrongdoing nations. You know, which, which wrongdoing nation do you want me to go to? Allah elaborates in the next ayah, قَوْمَ فِرْعَوْنَ أَلَا يَتَّقُونَ You need to go to the wrongdoing nation, the nation of Fir'aun. And I'll translate أَلَا يَتَّقُونَ a little later, but before we get there, this is already pretty terrifying for Musa a.s. He's already in shock that Allah is speaking to him. And he's been away from between 8 and 10 years, he's been away from Egypt. He ran away from Egypt, saving his life. He said, Rabbi najini min al al-zalimeen. As he was running away from Egypt, he said to Allah, Master, rescue me from the wrongdoing nation. The last time we hear Musa talk about Egypt, he described them as the wrongdoing nation, the evil doing nation. And now he goes up to the mountain, and Allah speaks to him directly, by the way, I rescued you from there, I need you to go back. An til qawm al-zalimeen. And he's thinking, maybe there's some other wrongdoing nation I can go to. So Allah says, let me clarify for you. Qawma Fir'aun. I mean the nation of Fir'aun. Ala yattaqoon. Do they not have any taqwa? Do they not have any con consciousness? I want you to contrast what happened. When Musa alayhi salam was hiding, Allah Azza wa Jal describes, khaifan yataraqqab. 
He was full of fear. He used to watch every step. Is there going to be police around the corner? Is there military around the corner? He would have to hide and you know, be invisible so he can escape out of Egypt and get out. Because every cop was thirsty for blood. Every one of them. You know, I was just telling this recently, when in, in cities, especially in cities where there's a lot of crime, when a crime happens against a civilian, then the police shows up in a half hour, one hour, whenever they show up. If you kill a cop, what happens to the police? They go crazy. They go bloodthirsty. In the case of Musa alayhi salam, when he punched, he punched a soldier. It's a military police state. The one who died was actually part of the military police. The cops are going crazy. Actually, in al mala ayatamiruna bikal yaktuluk. The, the, the chiefs, the generals have already made a scheme to kill you. They don't even want to arrest you. There's one thing that he'll get arrested. If he gets arrested, he'll be taken to court. When he's taken to court, the judge is going to be Fir'aun. Fir'aun loves him. Despite all of his kufr, Fir'aun still loves him. He might be a lenient judge. The police know that. So they don't want to show, arrest him. Because they know if they arrest him, he'll get off the hook eventually. He's got connections. Actually, he's got the highest connection in the land. So they were interested in what? Killing him. They wanted to get rid of him immediately. So when he left, he was really scared of being spotted. When Allah told him to go back, He didn't just tell him to go back and hide in some corner, in some quiet neighborhood, and keep a low profile, and maybe change your appearance, and don't let yourself be known. Where is Musa salam supposed to go? He's supposed to go to Fir'aun. He's supposed to go through the entire city and go all the way to the, the Pentagon, the White House, you know. He needs to walk right up to there, knock on the, and there's going to be security outside. Who's here? Well, I'm here to see Fir'aun. Who wants to see him? Let him know Musa is back. How's that going to work? How, is that, how in the world is that going to work? So when Allah says, go to the nation of Fir'aun, and then He says, أَلَا يَتَّقُونَ do they not have any fear of Allah? It's like Allah reverses. He should be the one afraid. Musa should be the one afraid. Allah says, aren't they afraid of me? Go on my behalf. You know, I want you to understand the psychology here. I, I, and you guys don't watch any movies, so this is going to be hard for me to explain, but I'm going to try. <laughs> okay, so there's this huge army of like soldiers and elephants and dinosaurs, you name it, and cannons, and there's this massive, this, as far as the eye can see, there's this army ready to fight. And from the other side walks up one guy and says, you guys better turn around if you know what's good for you. And they say, oh yeah, you and what army? Isn't it? They, when they see him, they, do they see an army? No, they just see this one guy. What's he gonna do? He's harmless. But he knows he has back. He knows he's got an army way bigger than anything in front of him. He's got a protection that they can't imagine. So he speaks like, you are ants. You're gonna get crushed if you mess with me. They don't see it. So he, Allah is telling Musa salam, go up to Fir'aun and let him know who's boss. Allah is. And you're going on my behalf. You're not going on your own behalf. So who's gonna protect Musa salam? Allah Azza wa Jalla, when they say you, and who's going to save you? His answer is in his Iman. His answer is actually with Allah Azza wa Jalla, you know? It's similar to when the Muslims went into Badr, and Allah sent the army of angels, you know? He asked for 3,000, Allah said, why not? I'll send you 5,000, <laughs> you know? And Musawi mean, ready for battle, marked for battle, subhanAllah. But any, in any case, so now this is what Allah has told him. Aren't they afraid? They're the ones who should be afraid, not you. So now Musa salam is going to respond. First, now there are lots of concerns with Musa. He's going to go back. It's not an easy mission. He might not even make it to the front door. He might get killed outside the city. He's going to list his problems. Allah has given him a mission, but there are some obstacles for him to complete his mission. So he's going to make a list of those obstacles. First obstacle. I would think the first obstacle is, Ya, ya Allah, when I get close to Egypt, I'm going to get shot with an arrow. When I, if I get inside Egypt, they'll cut my head off. They're going to kill me. That should be his first concern. And if I get killed, mission, mission over. You know, it's already done. What is his first fear? Qala. 
He says, Rabbi inni akhafu an yukadhibun. Master, I'm afraid, I'm so afraid that they're going to call me a liar. <laughs> because I'm carrying your message, they're going to insult your message. That's what bothers me. Nothing else bothers me. That is the failure of my mission. By the way, what was the Rasul's concern, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the surah began? You're calling them to Islam and they call you a what? They call you a liar. That's the same thing that is making Rasulullah sad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's nearly killing him. That's killing him before any soldier can kill him. So he tells Allah, Ya Allah, they're going to call me a liar. And the thing with Musa alayhi salam is, he's not just any personality, he's a very unique personality in the Qur'an. Not just his mission, his personality is different. When you lie, or when you do injustice in front of Musa alayhi salam, he gets upset. He gets really upset. And when he gets upset, he does stuff. He saw injustice happening, he had to take action, he threw a punch. He saw two girls who couldn't feed their own animals, he went in and took action himself. What ha and if he cannot take action, if he has to, because as a messenger, as a messenger, you're supposed to speak but not, not hit, right? And they're going to say horrible things and you can't get angry. You have to hold your anger in. This is extra hard for who? Musa alayhi salam. Because he's been dealing with problems a certain way. <laughs> so he tells Allah, they're going to call me a liar. And when they do, and I cannot react, sadri, my chest becomes tight. I get frustrated. This is literally the expression. I'm enraged. I don't know what to do now. I don't know how to respond to this. And when that happens, when I get frustrated, lisani, my tongue stops moving. My tongue stops moving. Wallahi al-Azim, I my mother tells me I talk a lot. But I tell you something. Just something personal about myself. If I'm extremely frustrated, extremely angry, I can't make one single coherent sentence. I try and words get jumbled. I know that about myself. Whether it's in the middle of, you know, playing sports and somebody was extra rough and I got upset, I can't even say that was illegal. <laughs> illegal. Like, when frustration is heavy inside, your tongue stops moving. Now we know Musa salam additionally had a stutter. And when somebody has a stutter, the angrier they get, the more frustrated they get, the more upset they get, the worse it gets. And he's, his whole job is to say words, to deliver a message. If they frustrate me, my, my tongue, which doesn't move, is going to kick in. My brakes will kick in. I won't be able to speak clearly, Ya Allah. وَيَضِيقُ sadri, My chest becomes tight. وَلَا يَنْطَلِقُ لِسَانِي And my tongue stops moving. Here's another part of this problem. It's not just that your tongue doesn't move and you cannot pronounce words. But when you are angry, and if somebody really upsets you, you may have had, for example, one of you gets invited, or the imam gets invited, or a scholar gets invited to go to BBC, or to go to CNN, or do an interview. They prepare their notes. They have the knowledge. They've been studying Islam for many years. They have the knowledge. There's no shortage of knowledge. They know what to say. But these media people, they're very smart. They will say the stupidest things and the most offensive things and you hear it and you'll say, how do I even respond to this? This is too insane to respond to. You'll get frustrated because you'll get blindsided not even knowing how to respond. Like your media personality will start the interview and say, hey, we all know Islam promotes violence. What do you say about that? <laughs> well, what's he going to do now? He, he came to speak about the community or this or that and he gets derailed. When, you're, when somebody's frustrating you and agitating you and you're angry, it's very easy for you not to be able to make your point very clearly. The interview is over, you're off the stage, you're like, I didn't make this point, this point, this point. I don't know what happened, he messed with my head. I don't even know what happened, what game was played. You have to learn to play that game. Musa alayhi salam says, I'm not good at that game. You know? How am I going to even move my tongue when they say these kinds of things? وَيَضِيقُ صَدْرِي وَلَا يَنْطَلِقُ لِسَانِي So he makes a call. He says to Allah, فَأَرْسِلْ إِلَىٰ Harun. Send Harun along with me. Give me Harun too. Harun is his brother. He hasn't seen his brother for many years. But he knows one thing about his brother. هُوَ أَفْصَحُ مِنِّي لِسَانًا We learn in other parts in the Qur'an. He speaks much better than I do. He's a much better speaker. Allah just made Musa alayhi salam a messenger 
with the, one of the greatest missions ever given. And he says, Ya Allah, I'm not that good. I need backup support. I need, I need Harun. He's pretty good. Instead of saying, this should be, all the credit should go to me. Nobody else should have the stage with me. He immediately says, well, this is what I'm good at, but there are certain things I'm not good at. He's going to be better than me. I need him with me. That's what he says. So, arsil ila Harun. Send the message to Harun also. Meaning, make, make Harun a messenger also. And then he says, finally, And they do have a crime on record against me. What's the crime on record against him? He punched somebody and that, that soldier died. That's what happened. He didn't intend to kill him, but that's what happened. So he's wanted for murder. They have that record against me. So I'm afraid that they will kill me. That's a legitimate fear that they'll kill him. But if you look at the list of his concerns, where is it? This is the last one. <laughs> him being killed, he understands, is in the hands of Allah. He understands that. It's a legitimate concern, but that's right now his priority is the mission Allah gave him. His life is actually a lesser problem. The things, his inability is actually a bigger problem for him. The propaganda is a bigger problem for him. So he made a list of these issues. Now Allah is going to respond to him. Allah first told him, go to Fir'aun. He could have just said, Ya Allah, okay, I'm going. But before he says, I'm going, I have a few concerns, Ya Allah. Here's what they are, one, two, three, four, five. And now Allah is going to respond to him. And Allah responds to him with one word. And all of, maybe one short, short of one, all of his concerns are answered in one word. Qala kalla. Not at all. Not at all. In Punjabi, they say, Gali koini. No big deal. It's nothing, bruv. You say to each other. <laughs> it's nothing. No big deal. No big deal. Why not? Well, they will make propaganda against me. Remember? Nah, don't worry about it. My chest will become tight. No, no, it won't. Don't worry. My tongue won't move. No, no, it'll move. Don't worry. They're going to kill me. No, no, they won't kill you. Don't worry. Not at all. None of this is going to happen. All of his negative concerns in one word, kalla, done. There's only one concern left. That concern is, can I have backup support with who? Harun. So the next word covers it. Fatiya, kalla, fadhaba bi ayatina. So, uh, no, no, not at all. Both of you go. When Allah says both of you go, who did he automatically include? Harun alayhi salam. Done. In two words, it's finished. All of his speech has been answered in two phrases. Then Allah gives him more than he asked. Because he asked Allah, these are the things that are stopping me. So Allah gave him all of that. But Allah said, but there are things you will need that you didn't even ask me. And I'll give you those too. Fadhaba bi ayatina. Go with our miracles. He didn't ask for miracles. But Allah will give him the staff turning into the snake. Allah will give him the hand that turns white. Allah will give him the nine signs eventually after years too. He says, go with all of our miracles. Ayatina. And by the way, Allah only showed him two miracles at that time. If you know the story from Surah Taha, Allah only showed him two miracles. What two, two miracles? The staff that turns into a snake, the stick that turns into a snake, and the hand that turns white. That would be, Fadhaba bi ayatai. Now, with two ayat of ours, two miracles. But the plural is used, ayatina. Allah is letting him know there are two, but there'll be many more. I'll be giving you even more. Don't you worry. My support is continuous. Now go. And go, and Allah says, now as he goes, he says, inna ma'akum mustami'un. We are going to be listening carefully along with you. Allah himself says, he is going to be a careful listener to this debate. This should give you a value and appreciation of this debate. What other debate would Allah say, go and talk to him and I'll be listening carefully. <laughs> Subhanallah. This is Allah's way of saying we should be listening carefully. This is Allah's way of saying this is profound. The exchange that's happening between you know, Musa alayhi salam and Fir'aun is profound. Now, Fatiya Fir'aun. So before Allah said to him, go to the wrongdoing nation. You remember? The nation of who? Fir'aun. This time Allah says, maybe you're still confused. Let me make it very clear. Fatiya Fir'aun. You both need to go to Fir'aun himself. 
You don't just go to his nation and go preach to the community. No, 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 no. You're going to start at the top. You will go to the executive, you know, mansion. You will go to the palace. You will get through security. How you're going to get there, that's not your problem. Just go. Straight for it. The people that issued the order to kill you, you're going to head straight for them. And you're going to demand to speak to Fir'aun. And here's what you're going to say. Fakula, both of you shall say, Inna Rasul Rabbil Alameen. No doubt we are the messenger of, Allah, of the master of all nations and all peoples. Now this peace needs to be understood. What, is, what has just happened here? Because in order to help you understand the complication, in a couple of ayat, Allah is telling him to go talk to Fir'aun directly. And as I tell you what he's supposed to say to Fir'aun, the next ayat are, Qala, Fir'aun responded. Fir'aun responded. Right now I want you to understand, again, you don't watch movies, so this is very hard, but I'm going to try. In movies they have different scenes. The camera takes you here, the camera takes you there, different, different angles of the, of the mountain. But sometimes you know what they do? They go from one scene in one city immediately to what? Another scene, another city. I know you haven't seen the movie, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, Finding Nemo. I know it's been a long time and some of you are very good with your Islamic history, so you know the movie. But, uh, you know, in Finding Nemo, there's a scene where, you know, the fish is looking for its child and it's very sad and it's sitting on the back of a turtle and these little baby turtles say, what happened? What, why are you so sad? And he says, it's a long story. And they all sit down, story, tell us the story. And so he starts telling them the story about what happened. And... But the way they played that scene, it's a long story in fact. But those turtles go and tell some fish. And those fish go and tell some dolphins. And those dolphins jump in the air and tell some birds. Those birds go tell some seagulls. Those seagulls go and eventually tell Nemo. So A narrated to B, Rawahu an, you know, is narrated to B, to C, to D, to E, to F, etc, etc. Now everybody who's watching, even a five-year-old who's watching the, the movie is saying, the first one told the whole story to the second one, and the second one told the whole story to the third one. Isn't that what happened? But when they watch the movie, do they show the whole story being told between A and B? Then they tell the whole story told again between B and C? Then the whole, people would turn it off. So what do they do? If the story is made up of ten lines, the first line between A and B, the second line between B and C, the third line between C and D, and even a child can understand, oh, that means they told the whole story. You see what just happened? They quickly transition in films, from one scene to the next, to get to the point. Now what happens in this incredible story is Allah tells Musa salam, go to Fir'aun, tell him that you're a messenger, tell him to let Bani Israel go, I'll explain that in a bit. Tell him to let Bani Israel go. Where is this conversation happening? On top of the mountain. Actually, Harun isn't even there. Musa السلام, is going to come down from the mountain. That took a couple of hours. Then he's going to gather his things. His family was waiting for him. He let them know, listen, I gotta go. Then he's going to go look for his brother. That's gonna take a few weeks. Then he's going to sit with his brother and they're gonna hug because they miss each other. They haven't seen each other a long time. How you been? By the way, I received revelation too. I'm a prophet too. Oh Allah, listen to the prayer. Yes, we got a pack for our mission. They had a sandwich or two. And now they're gonna head into Egypt. They turned left here, right there. There was a Burger King, there was a McDonald's. I don't know what they, you know, wherever they went. There are so many details. Are they mentioned? Nothing. They went to the security guard. Did the security guard say, hey, wanted for murder. Come right in. Is that what happened? No. They probably got stopped at the door, didn't they? They can't just walk in. And they're gonna have to say, who's here? Let, let, Mus let Firaun know Musa is here. And then the security guard's gonna go inside and Firaun's gonna be like, what? who? Musa? He's back? Call him in? And they're gonna go call him in. But when they call him in, they're not gonna let Harun in. Because Harun is from the slaves. And the slaves don't just get to walk into the palace. Musa is actually royal, so they're going to let him go in. And Musa السلام, is going to insist, no, 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 no. We both go together because we are one. Those of you that are students of the Arabic language, inna rasulu rabbil alameen. In other places, inna rasula rabbil alameen. We are both messengers. In this surah, he says, we are one messenger. We are two, but we have become one now. You can't separate us. 
So he demands not only to see Fir'aun, but to not be separated from Harun alayhi salam. So now they're going to get an audience with him. Go, go tell him. Now when they walk in, what's the first thing they're supposed to say? You know, when you walk into the court of a king, there's some protocol. You're so supposed to show respect. Oh, great king, thank you for making the time. When you go to get a chance to see a prime minister, a governor, a president, you go shake their hand. How are you, Mr. President? What an honor to meet you, etc., etc. Can I have a selfie? Like something. He's going to walk in. And by the way, he, Firaun doesn't call himself king. He doesn't call himself king. He calls himself Rabb. Ana Rabbukum al A'la. His words. I am your Rabb. They're going to walk into the king, and every time somebody walks into the king's quarters, they've been honored, and they have to show respect. You're going to both walk in, and the first thing you will say is, we are messengers, meaning we deliver a message on behalf of Rabbil Alameen. The actual Rabb of all nations, which means including yours. Is that a statement of respect or disrespect? You're walking into the king's court, you're going to walk into his palace with his guards surrounding the guy who nobody even looks in the eye. Inna Fir'auna ala fil ard. He used to look up and look down on everyone else in the land. He had high power in the land. No, he's an intimidating person. You don't mess with Fir'aun. You don't give him your opinion. Oh, you want to give me an opinion? Go cut him up. You're going to walk into his palace and you're going to humiliate him like that? Inna Rasul Rabbil Alameen. By the way, there's, another, there's the real Rabb, and we came on his behalf. You know like how ambassadors come on behalf of another king? That's what's happening. Musa and Harun السلام, have come as be ambassadors for the Messenger of Allah, for, for Allah Himself. And so what do they say? Because what's, what's when you come with a message, you call yourself a messenger, you have a message. What is that message? An arsil ma'ana bani Israel. We wanted to let you know that you better let the sons of Israel go. Bani Israel are slaves of Fir'aun. They're slaves. They've been slaves for many generations. We have come on behalf of Allah, the real Rabb, to let you know if you know what's good for you, you're going to let them go. That's the demand they make when they walk in. What should happen to somebody who makes a demand like that? You get slaughtered. And by the way, they're talking like they have this huge army behind them. How are you talking to Fir'aun this way? If, if you and I had a webcam or something inside this room, I would not be interested in seeing anybody else's reaction. I would be interested in seeing the reaction of everybody in the crowd. There's the ministers, there's the security guards, there's the guy that does the fan, you know, there's the guy that pours the coke. Those guys, they, have they ever heard anybody talk to Fir'aun this way? Musa salam walks in with Harun and they look like they've traveled from the desert, covered in dirt, you know, disheveled. Well, all, all he's got is a stick in his hand. And they're going to come before a grand king sitting up on a throne. And they're going to walk in and say, if you know what's good for you, you better let all the Israelites go. That's what we came to tell you. An arsil ma'ana bani Israel. The entire room is in shock. Before I go on, how much time before Maghrib? Because I need to time myself. 23 minutes? Sweet. Okay. It's like 6.15 or so, right? 6.15. Okay. Okay, I'll keep track. Because I, I, I want to stop the story at a logical point. Because, you know, it's like, it's better than a movie, I tell you. Okay. So now, how is Fir'aun going to respond? Fir'aun could just say, kill them. But you know, there are two problems with that. Allah describes, وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً minni. Allah put a special love onto Musa. That is the love that kept Fir'aun from killing him the first time too. He couldn't kill him. He loved him too much. Even though he's done this disrespect, he still can't, he just can't get himself to do it. There's another reason. If he just kills him, people are going to talk. Oh my God, Fir'aun got destroyed inside the castle. 
And he couldn't even do anything. He got so frustrated, he just had them killed. He didn't have an answer. He's going to look weak. Actually, sometimes the show of force is actually a show of weakness. When a government doesn't have respect, when a government doesn't have control, then you see more military on the streets. When a government doesn't have stability, then you see more police. You understand? When he has to exercise his power more, it actually means he doesn't have the power to command people with his words. So he's going to have to use words. He understands. He's a politician, he understands that. Now what happens next? He is going to use one of the most amazing tactics in debate. I mean, Fir'aun is an evil genius. There's a reason he's mentioned in the Qur'an so much. We need to study Fir'aun carefully. If you study Fir'aun carefully, you'll learn a lot about the media. You'll learn a lot. I'm telling you, you'll learn a lot about politics, you'll learn a lot about media. One time I was sitting with a gathering of ulama and somebody asked me, you know, there's guidance when we study Musa, there's guidance when we study Ibrahim, there's guidance when we study Nuh salam. What's the guidance when we study Fir'aun? I said, there's so much guidance, what are you talking about? Guidance isn't just, here's how good works. But guidance is also, here's how evil works. You need to understand that too. You know, أَرِنَا الْحَقَّ حَقَّا وَأَرِنَا الْبَاطِلَ بَاطِلًا We make dua to Allah, show us falsehood as falsehood. How will you recognize falsehood if you haven't studied how, how, how falsehood works? It's important to study these people that are mentioned in the Qur'an. Their tactics are timeless. So let me tell you this tactic. When people of truth argue, when they debate, they debate with evidence, proof, reason, logic. That's how they make an argument. If I'm right, here are my reasons. If you're right, give me your reasons. Whoever has stronger reasons wins the argument. Simple, isn't it? That's how knowledge goes forward, for, further. That's how, that's how truth spreads. But when, then there are politicians. Politicians don't use logic or reason or arguments. Oftentimes, they don't have the truth on their side. Oftentimes, to win a campaign, if they relied on the truth, they would never even be in politics anymore. So they have to find other ways of winning arguments other than truth and evidence. And some of these ways are very sneaky. Here's one of them. He's going to use a number of them. So I'll show you the first one. The first one is when somebody comes to you and says, you know, a son comes to his father and says, Father, I think we, shouldn't stop, we should stop selling liquor. We need to stop selling alcohol in our store. It's haram. Son says that to his father. And, you know, Allah says it's haram and here are the reasons. Is that a, is that a reasonable thing to say? Yeah. yeah. Father will say, this is why we brought you to England. <laughs> so one day you teach me Islam? <laughs> oh, you're a big sheikh now, huh? Is that a logical response? No. This, is, this is Islam? This is what it teaches you to talk to your father this way? Oh, you're going to teach? Oh, please, no, no, I should sit down and you should teach me. No, no, let me call your mother too. Yeah, look, he's going to teach us now. We should be listening to him. He's the new head of the household. I raised you. I paid for your school. You don't appreciate it. And you talk to me like this? Isn't this what you would hear? Now, what, what does Firaun do? Alam nurabbika fina walida? Didn't we raise you as a newborn? You're going to talk to me this way? You? You were here when you were a baby. And I raised you. I allowed you to be brought up in this palace. You're going to walk back into this palace and insult the one who raised you? And you spent so many years of your life here. Did you forget how many years of your life you spent here? Fallam, isn't it? Fallam. I raised you. I got that right? So, how? How are you going to... Question me this way. Musa salam is supposed to be humiliated now. I should never have said anything. You know, by the way, this tactic, not that your parents are Fir'aun, <laughs> but parents use this so good, man. They're so good at this. You bring up something reasonable and they're like, oh, okay, why don't you just throw me outside on the street right now? Because <laughs> they're like, I, didn't, I just said, I don't want to eat the bindi. Like, that's all I said. <laughs> A spouse can use it, a child can use it, a friend can use it, you know, religious leaders can use it, anybody can use it. 
What we're supposed to use in making our point is truth. Often what we use is a way to humiliate someone, make them feel like they're not loyal, they're not grateful, how dare they, how could be, they be so disrespectful, and you make them feel like scum. That's what he's trying to do. Didn't we raise you as a newborn? Didn't you spend many years of your life here? And so Musa alayhi salam, and he's not done. وَفَعَلْتَ فَعْلَتَكْ I love this ayah. He says, and you did that thing that you did. What did he do? He killed someone. Firaun could just say, you killed someone. وَقَتَلْتَ نَفْسًا You killed a person. He says, فَعَلْتَ You did. فَعْلَتَكْ That thing of yours. That you did that deed of yours. Alati fa'alta, which you did. Sounds like your English now. Sounds like my, my pain doing. You did that thing that you did, that one you did. You know you did, right? <laughs> you could just say you killed someone. No, 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 no. This is what's called the next tactic. Look, there are a lot of people here. You want me to tell everyone what you did? I'm the one on your side. I'm still covering for you. I'm still not telling people what you did, but you know what you did, right? You that thing you did, that you did, hmm? Hmm? Are you denying it? Wa al kafirin, and you are from those who deny. Are you denying that you committed the murder? He doesn't spell it out. It's as though he plays first, he humiliates him, and then says, by the way, I'm still covering for you. Look at me, you should be more grateful. Anta min al-kafirin is one of the most ironic phrases in the Qur'an. Here you have Fir'aun calling Musa kafir. <laughs> He's saying you're in denial. Kafir means something else also. Kafir means to be ungrateful. I did all this for you and you show this ingratitude. I'm even covering for you now. Wa anta min al-kafirin. Now all of this, Musa alayhi salam is supposed to be lost. Musa alayhi salam actually came with two basic messages. Don't forget that. The first basic message was, we are messengers of Allah. Number one, Rabbil Alameen, messengers of Rabbil Alameen. Number two, the Israelites must be set free. Those are the two things he came with, basically. When Fir'aun responded, he said, I raised you as a child, you spent many years here, you did what you did. Did he answer any of those two? He completely changed the subject, didn't he? That's his genius. You go in thinking you're gonna talk about one thing. But the people who are master manipulators, they'll change the subject and you'll feel bad that you even brought up the first subject. You won't even remember what it was. The conversation will be done, you'll be like, I don't know what, that, what just happened. But I feel terrible, I'll never bring it up again. You know? You could be so book smart, you could have so much knowledge, but if you don't understand how debate works, and how manipulation works, and how logical fallacies work, you'll get taken for a ride. Amazing. Fir'aun has just done such an amazing thing. I'm impressed with his tactic. I'm actually pretty impressed. What is Musa Aisam going to do? No, no, no. Um, well, thank you for raising me. And um, yes, I did do it. And, but if he starts answering these things, what is lost? His own message is lost. You see? So what is Musa alayhi salam gonna do? I know you don't watch movies. But there's a scene in Kung Fu Panda 2 <laughs> where he finds inner peace and there's a cannon being shot at him. And he takes the cannon and he shoots it back. But he uses the cannon itself. He didn't have a weapon of his own. The weapon that was used against him, he turns into a weapon of offense. You understand? So what was supposed to hurt him, ends up hurting the opponent. Okay, watch what the genius of Musa alayhi salam is. He says, first and foremost, fa, well, by the way, let's make a list of the issues Fir'aun raised. I, you, were, you were raised as a newborn here, you spent many years here, you killed a person. Three items. Okay, you were raised when you were newborn, you spent many years, and you killed a person. Of these three, which is the biggest problem? You killed a person, Musa alayhi salam is a genius. He's gonna start with that problem first. He's gonna say immediately, فَعَلْتُهَا إِذَنْ قَالَ فَعَلْتُهَا إِذَنْ He said, I did it at that time. You're right. Not denying it, because you said I'm denying it. I'm gonna start by saying, I did do it. What did he do again? 
He killed someone. Why didn't he just say, yes, I killed someone? This is again the genius of Musa alayhi salam. If Fir'aun is not going to expose me, why should I expose myself? He said, fa'alta, fa'alata kallati, fa'alta. So he says, fa'altuha. I did it. <laughs> You're right, I did it. What that is that you said, I did. Wa ana min al-dalleen. And I was confused at the time. I was from those who were lost. I didn't realize what I was doing. In fact, that is my only defense. And when I did lose, when I did make that mistake, now that he's admitted his crime, what does he say? فَفَرَرْتُ مِنْكُمْ I ran away from all of you. مِنْكُمْ is jama. It's all of you. So he's not talking to Fir'aun anymore. He's talking to the security guards, the generals, the advisors, the fan guy, the, the guy with the spear in the side. When you're in the court of the king, you only talk to the king. You don't look anywhere else. What is Musa doing alayhi salam? I ran away from all of you. That's another insult to the king. The first thing he said was an insult to the king. The second thing he's saying is also an insult to the king. Yes, I committed a crime and then I ran away from all of you. But then he makes the, makes the insult worse. And even the people in the audience are like, is he looking at me? Is he, are you allowed to do that? I didn't know you could do that. And then he adds such a gutsy statement, Lamma khiftukum. I ran away from all of you when I used to be afraid of you. <laughs> Whoa. He is saying loud and clear, I am no longer afraid. That is why I'm here. I used to be afraid of all of you and I'm no longer afraid. Lamma <laughs> khiftukum. How did you get this courage? Where did this courage come from? I mean, you ran away. Where did the courage come from? فَوَهَبَ لِي رَبِّي حُكْمًا My master, my master, the one I introduced in the first time. By the way, two missions of, the, of Musa a.s. Introduced the master, released the Israelites, right? He, he brought up the master again. By the way, my master, he gave me firmness. He gave me hukum. He gave me a decisive power. He gave me stability. And that's why I'm back. I'm firm because I have a powerful master behind me. فَوَهَبَ لِي رَبِّي حُكْمًا وَجَعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ And he made me from those that have been sent with a message. He repeated his first statement, I'm a messenger from my Rabb. So the first thing was, I did a crime, I ran away, but then I was made a messenger from Allah and I came back. Bringing back the first point again. But now there's another point he needs to make. What's that? What's the second part of his objective? Not only to say that he's a messenger of Allah, but what else? What about the Israelites? So here's how Musa does it in his genius. That is in fact, you're right, that is a favor you did for me. What's the favor? The favor is I raised you. The favor is you spent many years here. That is in fact a favor you did to me. That favor you did for me, is that the equivalent? Does that justify that you're going to enslave Bani Israel? Thanks a lot for raising me. Now you get to enslave hundreds of thousands of people? Is that what your logic is? Because that sounds stupid to me. That sounds insensible to me. He's basically questioning the ability of Fir'aun to think. He's calling him an idiot publicly in his castle. I told you you need to let these slaves go. You told me you raised me. me ra you raising me is the same as this crime? Absolves you of this crime? How, are you, how do you think? He's never been called an idiot in his own crowd before. In his own castle. This is incredible. When this conversation began, I want you to understand, when this conversation began, Musa salam was covered in dirt, coming from the desert, a criminal wanted for murder. He's in this low position, Fir'aun is in this high position. And as this conversation is going on, something's happening. It's shifting, isn't it? And Fir'aun doesn't know what to do, so he... He is stuck for a second. And now he has to deal with the problems he's bringing up. He has to deal with the fact that he keeps saying, Rabbil Alameen, Rabbi. So he says, Wama Rabbul Alameen. What, what Rabbil Alameen? What are you talking about? <laughs> so he couldn't avoid the subject anymore. And now, first he tried to frustrate and embarrass Musa. But guess who's frustrated now? Fir'aun is frustrated. And he says, Ma Rabbul What Rabbul Alameen? <laughs> When you say ma, what? When you talk about God or Allah or Rabb or Master, then you don't say what, you say who. Who is Rabbil Alameen? That's a genuine question. 
But if you're making a sarcastic comment and you don't say who is Rabbil Alameen, you say, what's Rabbil Alameen? Come on. So he's sarcastic, dismissive. And that's another amazing tactic of people that want to win for falsehood. You will ask them a question, you will bring up a point, and they will make it sound like your point has no weight by the way they talk about it. Rabbil <laughs> Alameen, what's that? Are you seriously? That's what you're going to talk about? They haven't given a reason, they haven't provided evidence, they haven't countered any argument, they're just dismissive and condescending and insulting. And by that tone, you feel like you've already lost the argument, even though you haven't. But they're very good at it. So he does it. Ma Rabbul Alameen, Musa alayhi salam seizes the opportunity. He doesn't pay attention to the fact that he's being sarcastic. He doesn't pay attention to the fact that he's being dismissive. He takes it literally. Oh, you want to know who he is? I'll tell you. Rabbi Samawat, qala Rabbu Samawati wal Ardi wa ma baynahuma. Oh, since you wanted to know, I'll tell you, he's the master of all the skies and the earth and everything in between. I need you to understand, this is not just a statement of aqidah. This is the point of debate. This is going on in the middle of a debate. The Fara'ina, Fir'aun believed that they, the Fara'ina believed that they were children of the sun. They worshipped the sun god. The sun is where? In the sky. And the sun has children that are the pharaohs. And because this, they are the, the, son of the children, sons of the children, they have the right to rule the earth. So the god of the sky is the sun, and the god of the earth is what? The pharaohs, the children of the sun. Okay, that, the, their god Ra, that's what their belief system was. What does Musa salam say? My master owns all of the skies. And he owns the earth, and everything in between. He destroyed his belief system in one statement. Because of his question, Ma Rabbul Alameen. And he, it's amazing that no longer is he interested in convincing Fir'aun. He's actually there to influence everybody else in the room. So he says, In kuntum muqineen. If the rest of you are interested in being convinced, if all of you are interested in being convinced, I'm talking about the real God. <laughs> He turns his attention to everybody else as if to say, look, this guy clearly is not very logical. He thinks raising a child is the same as enslaving a nation. Not very smart. And he doesn't understand what Rabbul Alameen is. I'm explaining it to you. If you'd like to be further convinced, here's my email. Just get, you know, look, he's, he's going to let them know. He's making himself available to the rest of the crowd. In kuntum muqini. Adhan in three minutes. Okay. Okay. One more thing and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up for now. Okay. Now, because he turned his attention to everybody else, who do you think the crowd is already impressed with? There's another problem. Don't raise your hand, but many of you have terrible bosses. Okay, Many of you are just horrible, terrible bosses. They yell, they scream, they, they threaten to fire you, they insult you, and you cannot speak in front of them, but when you're behind their back, you're like, oh, that, uh -huh. One day, your boss's boss walks into the office and yells at him. Do you enjoy it? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> You're recording it, you watch it in your break later. <laughs> Do you think the people in the room that work for Fir'aun have a good boss? No. They work for Fir'aun. Everybody else later who will have a terrible boss will say, my boss is Fir'aun, man. He'll be the ultimate example of a horrible boss. They work for Fir'aun. They're watching Fir'aun getting insulted and owned in his own court. You think they're enjoying it? Yeah. And you know, they can't say anything. But you could see it on their face, no? You could see it on their face. And now Musa is even talking to them. If in case you guys are interested, and they're like, <laughs> what is the greatest day of my life? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and Fir'aun senses it. He can tell people in the room are changing colors. Somebody's cheeks are turning red. This guy's pretending to cough even though he's laughing. It's like, <laughs> you know? What is going on here? So he gets mad not at Musa. Who does he get mad at? His court, he said, Qala Fir'aun. Fir'aun then cried out, screamed out. 
Qala liman hawlahu. He said to everybody around him, Ala tastami'oon. Are you not hearing what he says? Why aren't you angry? Why are you not listening to what he's saying? How come nobody stood up and said, Hey, how dare you speak to Firaun our God this way? Nobody came and defended me. Nobody likes you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so he's mad that nobody came and defended him. And this is already the Quran's way of telling us that the room is no longer owned by, by Firaun. It's owned by Musa alayhi salam. We'll continue from here, inshaAllah ta'ala. Barakallahu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum.